Welcome everyone to the Peter Carr BQE seminar series. If you tell me that you, thank you, thank you there. If you tell me you don't know who Nassim uh, Taleb is, I'm gonna say that you're lying to me for some reason, uh, because everyone knows this is the guy we found uh, right here in, in uh, I think it was in Crown Heights, you know? And <laughs> saw him on the street, says, how you doing? And we knew he was a local um, Brooklyn guy, even though he passed himself off as this like this Lebanese mastermind who's able to do trading and mathematics and, and persuasion and public speaking and be one of the most published authors in economics. So we're really happy to have Nassim here speaking to us today. Um, I have the proper introduction here. So I'm gonna, uh, if you don't mind, for those of you, maybe the two of you who don't know who he is, I'm gonna tell you something about him, okay? So uh, Nassim Nicholas Deleb was an option arbitrage trader for more than two decades, closing more than a half a million option transactions before becoming a researcher and scholar of risk and probability. He's the author of Dynamic Hedging, um, Managing Vanilla and Exotic Options, which bridges the gap between theory and practice, as well as statistical consequences of fat tails and how to adapt statistical methods to handle non-Gaussian distributions. He spent 12 years at Tandon as a distinguished professor of risk engineering and published more than 70 technical papers related to applied probability. His non-technical work grouped in the Incerto, which includes the black swan and, and ante fragile, that's probably the rest of exactly. Yeah, uh, it's published in 47 languages. We do have a couple of extra copies of the Incerto in, uh, in, in Japanese, uh, in Chinese, and in Korean, uh, in case anyone would like to see them on our shelves proudly displayed. Anyway, as you can see, I'm very happy to welcome Nassim here, and I hope you welcome him with a nice round of applause. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here, honored to be back. Uh, it's very pleasant to see people's faces because I, when I, after Peter, uh, Peter passed, I came to lecture and you know, I saw the eyes, so <laughs> I can see the other part of the faces of the students. I would like to thank Zara Patterson for this remarkable uh, ability to, first of all, organize a seminar and to, to make sure the speaker does what the speaker needs to do, which is you know, typically very hard to do. And it's wonderful organization and enthusiastic. And uh, I'm gonna say something here. I know about you before you know about me. Uh -oh. right? <laughs> because before writing Dynamic Hedging, uh, I, I read your book. He had uh, a very short, um, what, what year was it published? 91, I think, something like that. 91, Continuous Time Finance. And there was a very short book on Ito's Lemma. And this is where my initiation to Ito's Lemma uh, came from. I made a mistake in that book. I hope it won't be repeated here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, hold on, what's going on? Yes, this is complicated. It's working. Yeah. I don't need, to, no, 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 I don't need that stuff. Nice on stage or something. Like Great. So, uh, unfortunately, Peter is not here because I had a lot of conversations with Peter. I, start, I mean, I've known Peter for a long time, but uh, I got closer to him this time. And, and I, you know, Peter had the remarkable uh, attributes of improving his math skills at a fast and increased faster and faster pace this time. So he knew more math, but by the time he passed, he knew more about quantitative finance than anybody alive, okay? So a lot of these things were discussed with him because you know during COVID, you start <laughs> discovering the telephone and other uh, modern contractions that we, you know, uh, we didn't have before. So uh, I'm gonna talk about the errors, seeing things from the probability standpoints, committed during that COVID episode. So we're gonna cover pretty much every field. We have the packet, it has a bunch of peer reviewed papers, and also it has uh, some commentaries and interviews or more casual pieces that will turn into peer reviewed technical papers. Some uh, have been published in medical journals. So let me start with the first problem that to repeat, you know why I'm here, fat tail processes. Okay, we live in a world that has some statistical attributes, fat-tailed, visibly, 
Some students have attended my lectures on this. And by fat tail, it's not casual to say the process is fat tail. It's not casual. It's not something because you got to change a lot of things. And you see fat tailness comes in a lot of colors. You have gradations. I'm not going to get into the, the, the distinction except to say that it's not like changing the color of the dress. Once you have a fat tail process, you got to think differently because your asymptotics may be the same, but pre-asymptotic will never be the same because your, your, your uh, sampling properties are different. You need a much larger sample to figure out what's going on. And sometimes you don't see what's going on. So, 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 so you need, uh, so fat tails, it's not a casual statement. So in this book, Statistical Consequences of Fat Tails, which was finished during the COVID, uh, well, you know, you know, when you start learning about uh, bicycling at home, stuff like that, and I finished that book, it's basically saying, <laughs> We know that it's fat tail, we know the properties. A lot of stuff has been published since Pareto. The problem is, how do you do statistical can you work? Can the microphone that? so we can get more to the recording? Sorry? Maybe speak a little closer to the microphone. Closer to the microphone, or do you have a microphone? The microphone is off here. No, oh, no, that's on. I'm just taking the word. Yes, they? No. The microphone's not working. Oh, there it is, but it's not sensitive. Uh, maybe I gotta get closer to the microphone. Uh, it's fine. We're working on that. Okay. So, in, in, in short, to explain what, a, what the difference is between the two processes, there is a very clean demarcation. Uh, if I select randomly two individuals from the population and have an outlier, a total height of four meters and 10 centimeters, what's the most likely breakdown? Three and a half, 60 centimeters? What's the most likely breakdown? So the most likely breakdown is 205, 205. So conditional on having a very large deviation Odds are it came in pieces. So conditional on losing a billion dollars over a given year, it's more, it more likely came from two events than one. So basically in that environment, the probability of having um, two three sigma events in a row is vastly higher than one six sigma events. One sigma events, and so on. And, and the more you go on a tail, the more the, the difference increases. So that's that environment. Now we play the same thought experiment and apply it to wealth. I randomly select two people from the population. Total net worth $100 million. An outlier, you know what? The planet is large, a lot of people. What is the most likely breakdown? 50 and 50? No, it's going to be 999,000 and a thousand. Pretty much 100 and zero. So the difference between, uh, between these two is there's a demarcation. It's quite critical because in what I call thin tail environment, Gaussian, sub Gaussian, friends of Gaussian, the, the odds of uh, Losing money for an insurance company, if you're insurer in the Gaussian domains, a lot of money in the day is not very large. So you can diversify. You're not likely to have a million car accidents the same day in the New York area. See? And that has consequences that we'll see when you start scaling probabilities. So this is technical. I skipped the technical because you have a book. We have a book of really technical stuff. And, uh, and then we get to the uh, problem, the real problem, that the fattest tails are effectively pandemics. There's no fattest tail in pandemics. My colleague, Professor Cherillo, I'm sure you've taught many of you here, 
my colleague and I would have been hunting for uh, phenomena that were uh, misunderstood. And of course, we, you know, the two fattest tales and the two most, most misunderstood phenomena are wars and pandemics. Okay. So, and the latest thing we published during COVID is a paper on, we had to use tools because it's not quite a power law, you know, that you have infinities with power law, we don't have infinity with population. Uh, so we had to change the tools, adapt them, and we had a few tricks which merited, you know, publication rather than just casual uh, observation on, uh, because it's obvious that uh, with the data we have, then it's uh, power law. So we published on contagious diseases. <laughs> And, and uh, uh, of course, at the beginning of the pandemic, and of course, it has policy consequences that we'll discuss later. But the completely at variance with the policy consequences that were uh, in place at the time. So let's see where do fat tails come from? Multiplicative processes tend to be log normal or power laws. If you're lucky, you get a lot more. If you're unlucky, you get a power. Okay. And at high variance like normal, actually, it doesn't make much difference. It acts almost like a power law. So uh, the problem is that you have uh, the world is becoming more and more scalable. Like a dentist cannot, uh, the best dentist in the world cannot earn a lot more than a, the worst, not an average dentist in your neighborhood because she or he cannot uh, work on two million teeth a day. But the that, that, uh, that book writer doesn't have to rewrite a book every time someone buys it. So the world has been moving into with, with, with uh, uh, you know, globalization, with media, into what I call a uh, extreme style, where you have winner take all effects. And the same applies to the biological domain. An island would have biologically less pronounced winner take all effects than a continent. An island would have more ecological diversity per square meter than a continent. See? But you can think about it in terms of uh, literature, for example, uh, when, when the world had a lot of languages and people weren't globalized, uh, a Hungarian writer could probably make a living. Now you can't. The, you know, the Harry Potter was a, was a worldwide phenomenon that could not have existed a hundred years ago. And you can see it with the income in the black swan, when the income of uh, athletes, how the top, I mean, the top 10 athletes, for example, in relation to the average. And effectively, you have domains in which the top 10 make 80%, 90% of total revenue. So, uh, like an uh, opera, for example, or uh, even Silicon Valley at the time when we observed it, we looked at it, it was like a top firm paying more than all, most of uh, like almost all the money in some domains. Still applies today, Google, the top one firm has 90% of revenues or, or something like that for the search engine. Let's say. So, so scalability brings that. And, and of course, when, when, when we had uh, COVID, Everybody started talking about black swans. And I pointed out that in the black swan that I wrote in 2007, it explained that the pandemic would be a white swan. As a matter of fact, what well, the black swan was that it didn't happen before. That was, that was a problem because of interconnectedness. Now let's see the, pro, the, uh, the analytical errors made. And this started before, we started fighting this, what I call the pseudo empiricism. Uh, before uh, COVID, started finding it during the days of Ebola, where you had the economists to the right making naive claims about the danger of Ebola compared to the danger of uh, AIDS, for example, or uh, tuberculosis or other, other diseases. These being much less multiplicated, or currently less multiplicated. Very simple, you don't compare processes that have different variances. And you never compare processes that come from two different classes of distributions. 
And that mistake was very hard to explain in the beginning of COVID. So, for example, I don't know if you've heard of psychologists involved in decision theory, but the field is infested with psychologists who don't know enough probability to make maps like these, where you have risk perception uh, vertically and uh, statistical frequency of the event. And they tell you, well, the statistical frequency of something like COVID when it occurred is very low. So, hey, we don't shut down the country for cigarette related deaths or swimming pool deaths. Play the thought experiment. If I die uh, drowning in my swimming pool, the odds of my neighbor dying in her or his swimming pool would not change. But if I die of COVID, the odds of my neighbor dying, of course, has increased. So you have multiplicated processes that, that claim, that naive claim. But in the beginning, we were facing people who talk about rationality. Or it's irrational and a red common and adversity, and they say we overestimate red risk, small probability, all kind of bullshit. Sorry, what kind of nonsense. <laughs> uh, are you allowed to? We'll edit that out, don't worry. No, don't edit it out. Right? <laughs> all kind of nonsense, because they don't realize that there are two different probability basins, and they're comparing really uh, apples, not to oranges, but to uh, office buildings or something like that. You see, it was it's completely. Uh, this place. So let me talk now about fallacies of aggregation. It's a philosophical term, but we uh, in science we talk about scaling, how things scale, n of one, n of ten, n of hundred. So uh, and let's look at the probabilities. Why? How we have some class probabilities state differently from another? And, and the thought experiment is very simple. If I tell you that today seven thousand people died in America, right? If I tell you that tomorrow 7,000 people will die in America, what are the causes? Probably going to replicate the statistics of today. Okay. That's the maximum <laughs> entropy probability, right? Or, or, or some minor variation. Okay. But if I tell you that a million people died, what can it come from? War or pandemic. So when you look at things from the tail, it's completely different. So it don't have the same scale. So as of February 2020, when I did the experiment, the thought experiment showed that the probability of one death in car accident, one person dying in a car accident, is higher than the probability of one person dying from COVID. At a time, about 30,000 Americans were dying every year on the road. But then probability of 10 to the six million people dying in car accidents is vastly lower than a million people dying from COVID. And effectively, not long later, about what, 12 months later, we hit the million mark for COVID and car accidents were still 30 some thousand, okay? So, so you see that things don't scale. So on a replicated effect, the risk for a collective do not scale up in the risks of an individual. So this has a lot of philosophical and, and and uh, political implications. The, the risk for any one of us <coughs> is much lower than the risk of us collectively. Trivially, systemic risk can be extreme where the individual ones are low or vice versa. So that's the first thing that was hard to explain. Then we started, my friends and I, dabbling in medicine. And let me introduce Charles of aggregation. When someone tells you, hey, when did you get your uh, medical degree? They worked hard for the degree and they give you a hard time if you talk medicine. They don't give you a hard time if you, uh, if you say what they like you to say, but often you contradict their intuitions. Okay? And we were raising the alarm about COVID at the time. So for N of one, it's a medical clinical problem. So in other words, you need to be a doctor, have clinical experience, individual clinical experience, and nothing will substitute for it. So N of one, it's a doctor's problem. And higher than one, it becomes a medical statistical problem, what we call evidence-based. Yes, it's starting to be evidence-based. For N much, much higher than one, it is a statistical problem. 
And since I, I don't know if you realize that doctors have a problem, there's a wedge between clinical assessments of risks and actually the the, the, the empirical one. So and and, and and medicine now is a statistical uh, medicine, except if you go to the hospital because you broke the nose in a street fight around the corner. Except for these things, medical medicine became a statistical uh, thing. We look at survival rate of this procedure, survival rate of that other procedure, and pretty much you fit it to what uh, has been shown in clinic, large scale clinical trials. So it's a statistical problem. But for any much, much higher than one, it's no longer a statistical problem. It becomes a systemic Taylorist problem. And as you know, those of us who work in the Taylorist, like Professor Shirley worked in extreme value theory that was strained. And is uh, and, and we work with extreme value. So you see, we work use uh, extreme value estimators to work backwards from the extreme to the body because the value distribution doesn't matter when we talk about tails. Uh, and it becomes a systemic uh, thing. And one is systemic, the other is systemic. Completely different discussion. We'll talk about vaccines later. So the rule is you start from the tail. <clears throat> you start saying, okay, if conditional on that event happening, what could have caused it? We do that in finance. Conditional on you are going bankrupt. Okay, what could it come from? What? The S&P dropping 21.2%. That's the tail of that. So you work backwards. And that's more, it's more likely that the S&P will drop 21%. Of the day, 21%, then a lot of other you know, things occurring throughout the year. As we said, the probability of a 10 sigma event in under fat tails, what we call sigma, is much higher than uh, two times five sigma. Whereas the Gaussian is reverse. Second one, forecasting and growth rate. This is a little more difficult. But <laughs> We'll get to forecasting in a minute, but I showed the following thing is that people talk about growth rate of the Fed. So it's growing at 2%, 1%, 3%, 4%, 4%. 4%. And then yeah, I was correct. And they would translate the growth rate in fatalities. And guess what? It doesn't work. Growth rate can have a finite expectation and fatalities can have an infinite or near infinite, we have 7 billion people, let's say infinite is all, you know, more than 5 billion people die. See, how? Simply. Let's take uh, the simple equation, xt equal x0, e to some exponent. We know that from finance, okay? The distribution of xt, conditional on x0, transform, Okay, if it is going to be, uh, if, X, if XT is, uh, if R is Gaussian, sorry, R is Gaussian, what do you have? Log normal, okay? R is more than Gaussian, what do you have? A power law. Now you know the basin that I showed earlier. And that basin, guess what? It's not, no fun because you can have different expectations. So it's much higher tail anyway, the number of casualties. How? Because we're not talking about gross rate. Gross rate, you don't, you know, it doesn't have a thing. We're talking about number of people. It's a small error in the gross rate that only affects the gross rate a little bit. But you're exponentiating to produce a number of people. So that exponentiation messes things up. So you can have the moment, the, 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 the force moment, the infinite, okay or it's finite, it'll be much, much larger than, than, than the fourth moment of something that's not exponential. So, what that now, we had a fight with people forecasting. I forecast 200,000 people die. So we said, those forecasting are not rigorous, and those criticizing the forecast are even more stupid. So we wrote a paper, and it was a debate with a fellow called uh, John Ioannidis. And these people come from a school where science means forecasting, if you forecast, right? You don't understand the process. 
Science is about understanding the properties, which sometimes map to forecasts. But then here, the properties don't map to these forecast Y. This is the probability distribution of a lot normal XT. Say number of people dying of COVID or something, the number of casualties. Dying. This is probably distribution on normal. As you see, the most likely is close to zero. The mean is, is about very far away. Okay. So, and the mean is know, seven times median or something. So, you're never going to see the mean. So, when you forecast, what are you forecasting? Forecasting the mean. You don't have long life. The power law is actually worse. The mean is infinite. That's where you see mostly as peanuts. So making a statement about the probability distribution, I can understand. Making a statement about a number, X number will die or something. Oh, you were wrong because well, this guy got it better, or this guy, got it. oh, he got it wrong as well. Or hey, you're nihilist, you don't want us to forecast. No, you idiots. You want to get the properties right. So this is, so, so far we saw two mistakes. Our, they're all connected, okay? There's that when you have two different processes and they have different properties, they scale differently. And then forecasting, you can forecast in same domains. Election forecasting, maybe it's a binary outcome, it's fine. It's very put in convergence by the law of large numbers. Here, you don't have law of large numbers. You have one pandemic, you don't have law of large numbers of pandemics. And when you talk to people who do extreme value theory, the mean is foreign to them, like completely different worlds. What are you talking about? The mean, who cares? Hmm. We're talking about conditional uh, tails, conditional expectations, and the tails are not talking about tails, expected maximum, expected this. We're not talking about mean because you don't observe the mean. So <sighs> now let's go problem three. Static versus dynamic. Oh, I have some news for you that COVID is not an old person problem. Or as, as much of an old person problem as death is an old person problem. Okay. That, that's interesting because a lot of these had so, but the time we start working, we start getting convincing people about mediocre stand, extreme stand, simply because they have some instinct and they ignore psychology textbooks. Okay, and then they saw it, you know, when you had uh, in New York City, uh, you couldn't find uh, coffins, okay? They ran out of coffins in New York City. I mean, in March, 2020, if you remember, okay? It was not, not a lot of fun. So they, they it was, uh, so, but, but then the argument, became um, a, we had what we call COVID deniers, right? So not saying it's a virus, it doesn't kill people, it kills only old people. But the problem is the force of mortality, now the probability of death, let me see here, we have probability of death by Social Security Administration. Uh, at age 30, you have one in seven, five, 76, probability of dying in any given year. In the United States. So people, young people die. All right. Are you interested in dying? I mean, right. okay. So if you're not interested in dying, you should treat COVID like any other source of risk. And there was a major one. So between the age of 30 and the age of 90, there's very little difference in the increase of mortality over the COVID period. See, so in other words, if COVID increases in mortality by 15% to 90, it's within that range for the young people. So this is the way you gotta view it. It's not an old person problem. Death is an old person problem simply because a, a 70 year old has one in 48%, uh, one in 48, so 2% probably dying in a year. And COVID will boost that, that's it. They're more likely to die than the 30 year old. This is why you see more 70 year old dying than 30 year olds. And also, given the same age group, you're more likely to see men die than females, simply because just, you know, nature built, looked at that way. That's, uh, 
So the, uh, I mean, the math behind it, of course, mortality, you can find it in the text uh, document, but the effect on life expectancy is critical. But now, what is the problem? It's the uh, dynamic versus static argument. Is that young people saying, all right, you know what, we're subsidizing old people. First of all, if you think, if you have a problem with us focusing on spending money to save old people, then we should stop funding cancer. But also, because it's the same thing, it's pretty much, and actually the, the, the rate of deaths from COVID, you know, the boost of the deaths from COVID, at the age of 50, is pretty much flat and drops even later. So, but the problem is, that they don't think they're going to get cancer later. Or they don't think they're going to become old. You see? So the same argument should be used across all medicine. Medicine is more costly, but we pay for it because we know that we're going to age one day. And there is something called intergenerational. Uh, the way you treat the, the elderly today is the way you'd like to be treated when you're going to be old. And you had no choice. It's not a matter of ethics, it's a matter of mechanism. If we stop funding cancer by the time we become uh, exposed to the disease, well, maybe too late to start funding. So, what would you? So, you can't really go by cohort. You're forced to do it dynamically. You would dynamically. So, if you frame things right, you can convince any young person that you're going to be old one day. Okay. And you're saving for retirement today. Well, okay. So, it means that you're, someone's forcing you to think about the problem. Well, the same thing with COVID. It's not an old person problem. You're going to be old. The next pandemic will be the same effect. If some pandemics kill the young disproportionately, or some like polio affect the young, okay. But the uh, at least this class of viruses, okay, seems to be flat past the age of 30, 40. And there's an ethical argument coming with uh, with this. We have a lot of people here from Asia. I mean, from East Asia. Uh, and uh, they would not understand this notion of gerontocide. All civilizations understand intergenerational commitments. Like the death year, you take care of your grandparents, and you also like the grandchildren to take care of you. <laughs> See, it is uh, people don't fail to understand. But you know what? In Sweden, they said, well, it's an old person problem. Why should you pay for it? The old civilization had different behavior from newly, uh, from people who just arrived on the block, right? So uh, you can understand that most of you are from Asia and or the Mediterranean. The, the, the highest title in Arabic culture is Sheikh. Sheikh means old, simply. And the Council of the Elder is a Senate. So Senatus is the same for Greek and Latin. So it means the eldest. Rule and, and, and you know you're going to be old one day, or you hope to be one old one day. Mm -hmm. So, so anyway, so this is there's something in the argument. This is both at, at, at both at the practical, I'm bringing this up on the practical level, mathematical level, and at the ethical level. Okay, a lot of people are missing the argument still today. They say, Well, why should I support it? Why should I, you know. Pay to support, you know, for a disease that kills old people. So, as I showed, it's not just old people. Then you should probably apply that to, car, to everything. Okay. Uh, and then the other uh, argument is dynamic versus static. We have to be really stupid not to realize that you're going to be old one day. <laughs> I mean, and but they are. I mean, a lot of uh, these people are the, who are uh, from like. Now let's look at, uh, 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 yeah, the here is like uh, the highest, uh, the Council of the Elders, right? And Asterix, it's uh, French. If you're not French, yes. you probably will get only half of it. If you're French, you get it all. Anyway. Fourth problem number four, but the vaccine disinformation. So, uh, you know, the mRNA vaccine, I was skeptical in the beginning because I like to see data. 
without the MRA, without the vaccine, we wouldn't be uh, here now. Because all these models, and we're going to talk about epidemiological models, are naive. They don't take into account fat tails. They don't even have post-small equations to already understand the problem. It, it's a field, epidemiology is a field that's not very sophisticated for realistic. But then again, they, they intimidate others because they use math, but mm -hmm. they scratch, find nothing. Uh, and there's another thing that they make assumptions of immunity. COVID doesn't have immunity, it looks like. You get it, and then you get it again. And the second time can be worse, and it damages you every time, all right? It's how much? And think about it, if you get it five, five, 10, 15, 20 times, it's not gonna be fun, even if you're 18 years old, okay? So, uh, there is this uh, problem with, with uh, the, uh, the vector, but there's something interesting. So the, we got the vaccine, okay? The vaccine saved us, basically. When I realized how much it saved us, it's not, it's not the, the, the arguments used against the vaccine. And also using my own work. But visibly, you need time, no? You need time to uh, for something to show up. So you see, if you smoke today for 20 years, you get cancer 20 years from now. Is it true? Yes or no? Probably. Sorry? Probably. Then you need 20 years? No. You need to have a distribution with the 20 year mean. Oh, okay. So the minute you have variance in the process of when you get cancer, so then it's much more interesting because we know that anything related to cancer has. Um, let me, let me find a slide. Okay, has, has some kind of uh, Poisson distribution and you need a lot of things to go wrong, okay? So the, the slide is here. No. So what happens? that you know that Poisson arrival time, the time between Poisson observation is an exponential. And say to get cancer, you have to have X number of genetic mutations. Well, we looked at the numbers for Fukushima, we look at numbers, all these diseases that tend to show up late, and it's a distribution. And the minute it has variance, you have a tail. So what I did is I took the distribution of the minimum you know, say the, the, the gamma distribution is for how many, for say, n of one, two, three, four, five Poisson arriving during the period, which would cause your, uh, your disease to happen. So what happens is the distribution of the minimum goes to the left when you take time as your sample increases. At the time I did that, we had three and a half billion jabs. And I said, okay, what? We have uh, six months of uh, sufficient to figure out why we can trade space for time. See? So in other words, if it takes you 100 years in the casino to win uh, 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 to get to win at roulette subsequently and then go win at blackjack and win this, if you want, you have spent 100 years in the casino to achieve all of that, to have all these uh, things happen to you. But if you send a billion people to a casino <laughs> At the same time, it will take you half a day, right? So the distribution would have a tail. Even though uh, Hiroshima took a while for cancer to show up, if you look, a lot of things happened in the beginning. So if you look at the beginning, so you can see that tail. And then now we have what, 10 billion jabs? And how many jabs on the planet? So you, you know, so you have a distribution and we still haven't seen anything. We have this information or we have this, this that, but we haven't seen anything critical. So you can eliminate DNA effects from that. Again, because it's like a uh, the DNA uh, problems have to be series of poisson. They can be correlated. If they're correlated even, even more, even better. So the whole statement is, is it delayed? or is it stochastic with a mean 
that is delayed. See? So you would expect today, if it's 20, you would take 20 years to get that, that to have a course of 100 million or so of exhibiting that problem already or more. So that's uh, the uh, that's uh, the thick distribution of the minima pushes for gammas pushes down very quickly with numbers. Uh, this has not been published yet. I mean, published just put the number, it's too trivial. Uh, but every time I, you know, uh, I talk to people in that field, oh, we didn't think about it. This great idea, publish it. It's trivial. It's just like very simple properties of the, the of, of sums of Poisson. Okay. Uh, okay. There also, as you observe in the discussion, people weren't aware of Simpson's paradox. They showed us that the mortality rate of people who had the vaccine was higher than the rest of the population. Okay, what does it mean? Why is this, why does this, uh, doesn't tell you anything about the vaccine? Think about it. All people were vaccinated first and they tend to die more frequently than the rest of the population. And effectively we even have paradoxes that, that, that people weren't aware of like if in, in the sum of, I mean, this is this is the math, right? Then every bucket A is, has higher proportion than B. If you take the aggregate to the reverse. It's another aggregation that works. So it's simply we sort of dividing, all right? And your samples are not homogeneous. So you can see in every bu bucket that those vaccinated were 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 dying at a lower rate than the unvaccinated. But if you took the aggregate, guess what? Uh, the thing reversed. So, okay. Now we have uh, inseparabilities, okay? Inseparabilities is when you start separating something that should not be separated. Say in the economy versus COVID. What, what, do, you, what do you mean the economy versus COVID? I mean, they, they're inseparable. I mean, if you, it's not like you're, if you're saving the economy by not, Worry about COVID. So there were a lot of uh, logical mistakes in, uh, with that. Let me continue. One, masquerades, mask and nonlinearities. First, the first error was masked in the beginning by saying there's no evidence that masks help. That's not the way we deal with uncertainty. We deal in payoff space. There's no evidence that. If someone gives me, you know, a bottle of water in a foreign country and say, well, there's no evidence that this is poison or this is bad water. I say, oh, there's no evidence. I'm not still going to have to drink it, right? So, but here there's no evidence that masks help. Show me evidence that masks hurt before, okay? So they were using the wrong argument. And then the other thing also is that a lot of people thought in the UK that you had to wash your hands because there was this paper circulating I don't know if you've seen this book by Bill Bryson uh, on, on health. Bill Bryson, the famous author, he wrote, he wrote, he wrote about shit he knows nothing about, or right? so about stuff. And he said it himself. Well, he said that viruses uh, like the cold were transmitted uh, in his book. I read it during COVID. I was like, what the hell is he talking about? Okay, on some study, which probably you didn't replicate, all that based on one study or another study showing that. Uh, uh, the common cold was transmitted by touch, not uh, you know, uh, not by breathing. And a lot of people, that was a bestseller in the UK. So a lot of people led to believe that you had to wash your hands, right? So you know they were getting COVID and forget about masks. So that's level one error. But then there was another problem uh, with masks and we wrote a paper on that. In the mask studies, they didn't understand nonlinearities. That, and then we're gonna talk about nonlinearities now applied to many other things, is that if you drop the viral load by 10%, you may decrease, since everything is a sigmoid in, in, in the medicine, you may decrease the probability of infection by 95%. See, just a little bit of drop in viral load, it doesn't matter one to one. And the other thing, then think about that if I have a mask and you have a mask that were thin compounds, 
So, so it took a while to catch up. So we wrote a paper that was published in a medical journal. Uh, you have it in a packet. It was, uh, it took a while, it took a year to publish it. It was too late, but by then, you know, you look at now we don't need masks anymore. It was um, uh, show, discussing the non areas that showed how the mass studies were, were, were either not well powered or, or, or not well designed. But every time there'd be a study saying, oh, masks didn't help, first of all, it'd be bogus, and it'd be trumpeted on the web, like this, on Twitter, like 60,000 likes, or something like that. Every time there's something, it's, it's like, we're always trying to stop people from wearing masks. I can understand the government in the beginning wanted to save these masks for hospital workers. But I don't understand these psychopaths, right, who want. You know, tell you that you know the name of freedom. I should uh, infect you, okay. so or prevent others from uh, having masks. Now let's continue with nonlinearities a little more, and we know from option trading that the market drops one percent one day and then one percent the other day. You don't do as well as two percent one day and zero the next. Okay. Which is why, again, when you forecast, you don't forecast the average, you have second order effects. We know that from option trading, right? Well, the same thing is if you have demand, the 50 one year, year one, and 50 year two is going to be much smoother than five year one and then 95 year two. Okay, so it looks like the planet is short volatility. And that's a supply chain problem. Now, this this I've been working on because I'm an option trader and you deal with not linear. It's, it's like uh, it gets into your blood understanding on there. The market like large room theater with a small door. Okay, so you focus on the size of the door, not the size of the theater. Okay, and you had what? Guess what? A very short narrow door. So shot five with the supply chain thing. It's like the narrow door at a time. All right. So that was that was a problem and. It comes with this increase of fat illness uh, on planet Earth because if you see the distribution, that was before we, we now I think that the distribution of natural calamities may have increased, but, but even equalizing before it was, we thought that it did not up to like 2011. You still see that an earthquake in Kobe, all right, carried proportionally vastly more effect economically than the earthquake in Tokyo in 1924. That's sure the same one happened in Tokyo would be uh, vastly, it had a lot more impact on Japan and the rest of the world now because of interconnectedness and efficiencies. You know, things that are efficient become more fragile. So-called efficiency may not be always very efficient. So, uh, and then finally, we had to live with the uh, with, uh, notion of pathological risk aversion, whether we accept that it's pathological or not, because we start to value human lives more and more. And look at how much money we spend to, to, uh, for safety on roads. How much money do we spend for the office just because we're afraid of lawsuits? Think about flying, how much money we, we, we spend on making sure that flight has close to zero probability of, you know, of, of not making it, all right? So we spend a lot of money on places and nobody finds it irrational. So, you know, pandemics suddenly, weirdly, uh, people started spreading that it would be very irrational to do that. So I'll close two things. Number one, that paranoia is sometimes the most logical thing you should do. And there's nothing paranoid about worrying about your tail risk. But, and, and what they call panic is not panic. And you should do it early, not late. Okay. I mean, of course you must, you know, you don't need to overreact, but we have other, if you have something called risk fatigue, if you keep quiet most, but you gotta, uh, there's some things you can, you, you should come very quickly. You see the, the the proposal we had initially for vaccine or anything is that 
instead of wasting time on all these lockdowns, you should cut prevent transportation between areas or test. You know, the ancients had um, these, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, uh, these uh, quarantine places. Okay, the, around the Mediterranean, where when a ship came in, to just you, you you lower that you 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 attenuate the tail. We have something called testing, okay? but it took the Trump administration eleven uh, uh, no, thirteen months. Okay, and so, no, they had thirteen months instead of all of the stuff to require PCR testing at the border. And we had testing in the beginning of the pandemic. Probably you can confine it in one place. And it's only when, when we had the Biden administration that, that, that was the first day or the first month, but within days, okay, they had PCR tested, which is the most logical thing, okay, to test. If you test your, your, uh, your, of course, it's not fail proof, but it will reduce the rate of transmission dramatically. And, and, and that our ancestors didn't have. They had to put people in for, for 40 days. It's called quarantine for 40 days, but the, the rule is like depends on the pandemic, depends on where it came from, between seven and 12 days. Waiting for someone to get sick, actually, right? How you can do it with a simple test. So the second thing I want to talk about is success or failure. Just imagine COVID without the internet. So the Talmudic expression that says, God gives you the cure first and the disease later. Just imagine what would have happened to us if we had COVID without the internet. And now I say, well, also, just imagine if we didn't have the vaccine, what would have happened? I mean, the vaccine is not, we're still waiting for side effects, still very vigilant, still waiting to see what the cost can be. But just imagine, right? What would have happened? Thank you for listening to me. And we have about uh, three, five minutes for questions. Any questions from the audience? Please. I can't hear you. Or plus, we can't, we, you know, and you record. try to repeat the question also. Oh, okay, great. Recording. So, how about, okay, how about? You pick up the question and you repeat it to me. Go ahead, say it. <laughs> <laughs> a small voice. After evaluating the post COVID world um, and looking back at your past work, especially with Black Swans, the book, is there anything that you would currently reconsider or even are investigating? I, I repeat the question here. So we have people from here repeat the question. Okay, I'm going to start a little bit. I think you're saying uh, in the and then what we learned from COVID is that it caused you to think differently about anything you wrote in the Black Swan, you know, about the interpretation of these zero. zero. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I correct the things in the Black Swan, uh, mistakes of uh, first name of someone, for example, Andrew versus Marcel or something like that. Uh, correct the stuff in the Black Swan, but nothing uh, that makes sure. And also commas, the right, of mistakes. In the, Typos of the black swan, yes, over time, but haven't been did not find anything for the story. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, just want to share with you that uh, Taiwanese insurance, uh, <laughs> the insurance company, they provide product against COVID, which is uh, the number one pet health uh, distribution in your category. So you said the, the, the to repeat the question. So people and the, the, the insurance companies in Taiwan yeah. provide the insurance the insurance product against well, COVID. But you mean against so paying you? Uh, their if COVID. you are COVID positive, then yes. they will pay you. The uh, companies okay. will pay you. Yeah, and then today they lost about like uh, five billion uh, US. Uh, okay, dollars. so they lost money visibly. I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know much about insurance. I know the mathematics of insurance, not the practice of insurance. But the first thing you learn when you open an insurance book is that you have there's such a thing as uh, adverse selection. That's not so. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I had I had a very uh, hard uh, COVID uh, you know thing 
and I and I and I picked it up in a hospital, probably in Beirut, the UB hospital, the American University Hospital. And at the time, I was looking at the COVID yard, and you had three old women in the hallways. Anyway, so I picked it up. So it was it was very harsh uh, for me, and uh, and I thought I had immunity, but uh, but this is the. I, I don't, but I know that I can pick it up again. You see, uh, now I know. It. If you if, if you don't if you got it visibly, you, you're prone to getting it. So I probably should go and buy that get an insurance. More likely to get it than someone else. I think that company might not be in a position to offer you much. Insurance. Yeah, yeah, probably. Plus, it depends on how, how they pay me. If they pay me in uh, in, in cash on. Uh, uh, on on a Taiwanese bank, they deal with a lot, or they pay me in a in a bank account in New York. Uh, I think that, uh, you only need to pay like thirty dollars for one year coverage. And thirty dollars, yes, for one year coverage. US dollars for and this is not an insurance company. This is a uh, <laughs> yeah, I think they're a solution scheme by <laughs> some uh, very rich person who wants to distribute the find find a way to distribute the billions. Go ahead. Well, that's the theory I didn't expect to hear. Uh, any other questions? I'd like to ask one if, if no one has that. Go ahead. Uh, what would be the Jackson problem in the uh, technical concerto? I, I the technical concerto. I have two I'm working on. One, okay. I like to talk about my technical concerto. I don't like the regular concerto. So the the so the first one was statistical consequences of fat tails. How you change uh, the the thing. The second one is on convexity and uh, on what maps to anti fragility. And I'm a little delayed because I was working on medical in the paper in oncology. Those response to, to uh, and, and I think it's going to be called something like uh, silent risk or something like that. And the third volume, uh, I'm working more on the third than the second volume is on uh, stuff like food by randomness on uh, on uh, on common errors but not made by full by randomness was errors made by people who didn't know uh, statistics this one errors made by people who know statistics <laughs> like uh, like uh, correlation for example i have a paper i think i showed the students when i lectured uh, so this one is more entertaining because when i when i discuss it with people they, they, you know they, they immediately become very interested uh, ah, they are making this mistake before on, on errors with correlation, errors with, uh, with very standard statistics, dimensionality problems. So that's volume three. So maybe why does, don't I make it to volume two? I don't know. I'm, uh, you know, you said in some ways, but so I'm working on both, but I'm posting online uh, and I'm publishing uh, peer reviewed uh, things. Uh, so you're also in chapter. Sorry? You're also uncertain yourself. I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> it shares to it incidentally, the Italian thing is Italian, and, and the non Italian thing is Italian. In fact, it's Latin. Wow. So you can pronounce it also in Kerto. So it's in Latin. The recourse, but you can. You can. What does it mean? Uncertainty. Yeah. Or uncertainty. uncertainty. Yeah, the Certo is uncertainty in okay. Latin. Yeah. Or the uncertainty. Questions? You have you have a question. I have one question. Yeah. yeah. So um, when I think about this sort of fat tail distributions, I always think of them as being given exogenously or knowing that ahead of time what that distribution is, and imagining your interpretation is coming from some specification of the distribution. But as I experienced COVID, from my point of view, I felt that the statistics were being affected by or manipulated by political forces on the one hand, and also by Medical forces, the other, the other hand, that had reasons to sort of perhaps overstate, right, the uh, certain statistics it's, or or suppress other statistics. And I'm wondering how it does change, change the scale. Only change the scale doesn't change anything to the problem. Well, if you were having this, this sort of linear, I just said you could change the growth rate in a finite fashion. What we said it just doesn't matter. This is why I was telling people don't waste your time on the growth rate. Just try to cut that damn tail by uh, any measure you can at a time, the uh, most effective one was um, preventing uh, planes from, you know, go from Wuhan to Taiwan to whatever the United States, West Coast. I mean, just cut down or at least test people. We didn't have testing in the beginning, ground planes until we have testing. 
So the whole saying is, this is why I'm telling people, you're in the of time, whether growth rate is 2% or 2.3%, it doesn't make a difference. To the solution, is it so that they come back with the, the channel in the most uh, uh, technical and non technical? Uh, someone asked me to summarize it. And it took me, uh, I started the circle when I was uh, a long time ago, right? When he had hair. So, uh, so it, took, but it took me a long time, more than a couple of decades, to figure out uh, what it was about, and two and a half decades. And, uh, and I figured it out is that it's much easier to make decisions under uncertainty than, than, than under certainty. So let me give you a very simple example. If I tell you, I'm not sure about the safety of this coffee, what do you do? A very easy decision. So, so this nonlinearity is, and that you can generalize for nonlinear responses. Okay, it's very easy to say, okay, I'm not going to board the plane because I'm not certain about the, the pilot of the plane. And I apply that to a climate problem. They say, well, all these models, they're confusing. I say, oh, yeah, but it makes it easy. What? Yeah. If you have such a variance across climate models, don't pollute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's like if you have a variance as to the, the opinion of expert as to the safety of this coffee, don't break it. You got so many other things to do. <laughs> That's it. We wrote a paper on that and we got a lot of flack from, uh, from both sides. So you have these uh, uh, manga, no, neo manga, whatever these guys are, uh, at the time, it was pre that. Uh, or no, uh, you know, you want us to, you know, not pollute your. Uh, World Economic Forum agent or something. And then the other guys say, oh, our models are bad. <laughs> so the variance in the models is more information than what the models can give you. And you have a high variance in the models, you flip the tail. As you flip the tail, don't thumbs up. Plus, on the nonlinearity, you know that every additional gallon of, uh, of oil harms more than previous one. And that's one of the properties of, uh, of nature. So, Right. So thank you uh, again for attending. Thanks for not, now finally I can connect the face, the lower part of the face to the person. Uh, and, and, and I'm honored to be here. And, uh, and I wish Peter, you know, Peter Carr. Oh, of course he's here with us. He's here with us. <laughs> Knowing him, <laughs> I'm sure he is. <laughs> uh, and thanks a lot, my friend, for, for this. For yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. I'd love to say we have a banquet and we're going to invite everyone, but we don't. So, <laughs> but I think we have the room to socialize a little bit afterward. Maybe a few would be like.